good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you once again on this, the 12th edition of the ISG Masterclass. Uh, this morning, you are seeing a slight change in the format. Instead of uh, Dr. Professor Govind Makaria starting the session and introducing you to the session, I am doing the honors for the simple reason that Professor Makaria is the speaker uh, this morning. Uh, so far, we have had 12 excellent, 11 ex excellent sessions of the ISG Masterclass that have been thoroughly enjoyed and appreciated by the audience. As you know, we have had a large uh, number of people uh, tuning in for this program, not only from India, but uh, from neighboring countries, several African and Middle Eastern countries. And uh, the response has been quite gratifying for the ISG Governing Council. Uh, uh, today, the topic on which Professor Makaria will speak is an approach to a patient with chronic constipation, which is an extremely common problem uh, seen quite as much by the general physician, if not more, than by the specialist gastroenterologist. So I expect Professor Makaria to speak to the physician as well as to the gastroenterologist in how they would uh, approach uh, this uh, problem. Uh, for this uh, um, uh, morning session, uh, the panelist is none other than our one of our really recent past presidents and a well-known figure in uh, gastroenterology circles, uh, Dr. Naresh Bhatt who is uh, tuning in from Bangalore and uh, will be uh, moderating uh, during as the session moves along. You're all familiar with the format. In fact, so familiar that we can already see about half a dozen questions in the chat box uh, waiting Govind even before he has begun his uh, uh, talk. So uh, all of you are requested to send in your queries on the chat box and uh, somewhere halfway through his talk, at about 20, 25 minutes or so, Professor Makaria will break and we will have a few questions that will be taken. Uh, the session will be conducted by Professor Naresh Bhatt and uh, thereafter we'll complete the talk. At the end, as we've been doing in the last uh, three or four um, sessions, Dr. Makaria will have a few multiple choice questions for audience participation and audience poll on these questions. And then we'll take up as many of your questions as we can manage uh, before we wind up for the day. With these few words, I will um, uh, now invite uh, Dr. Govind Makaria to please uh, deliver his talk on an approach to chronic constipation. Govind, please. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Saraswat. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy and, and, uh, to, to, to join ISC Masterclass today as a speaker. And this is a true honor to me uh, to speak to very audience, uh, uh, very uh, very uh, august audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhatt, uh, for moderating this session. And uh, I'd like to share my screen and we we'll go to one second. Yogita, can you help out with the share, screen sharing? Seems to be in a problem. Sir, can you see yourself, Dr. Govind, sir? I just want got minimized. Oh, yes. Half the screen go in. Yes. I think you need to set that right. Yes. We have it now. The screen visible? Yes, I think we have the full screen now. Uh, you are um, all set. Uh, thank you very much, uh, very much again. And uh, uh, let's talking about uh, the how do you approach a patient with constipation. Again, uh, I would post a six step uh, strategy for looking at patient with constipation. What it is, how do you classify constipation? Know the patient factors which can modify the presentation of constipation. 
map the disease, treat and optimize, and uh, we'll talk about uh, certain special situations where constipation can be uh, difficult to treat. Coming first to what it is. So if you look at uh, the constipation and uh, the normal physiology of uh, defecation, we have a stool comes in the rectum and, and, and this stool keep accumulating in the rectum. There's increase in intrarectal pressure and subsequently uh, there will be many more things will happen in the uh, anorectal coordination which leads to stool. But there has to be enough stool in the rectum before the defecation reflex starts. If there is a uh, defecation reflex to start, there has to be increased intrarectal pressure and defecation occurs, then there will be relaxation of puborectalis muscle that leads to opening of angle between rectum and anal canal. And also there is a relaxation of uh, external anal sphincter and internal sphincter. And everything is complete, then there will be passage of stool uh, completely and the uh, patient will have a, and the person will have a complete defecation. So this is a normal physiology. If there is any defect out here in the process, uh, they will lead to constipation. For example, uh, the coordination at inner rectum is extreme of extreme uh, importance. So here what we have, if there is a stool in the rectum and if uh, the whole process does not uh, ha happen completely, there is no incomplete relaxation or the sphincter does not relax completely, the stool will pass, but only some amount will pass, and patient will have a feeling of obstructed defecation. The whole stool, despite a full defecation, the stool will stay in the in rectum, and therefore, it's important that this person, the stool will remain for a long time in rectum, therefore, the stool may become hard and dry, and the person will have, a, person will have to strain to pass this stool out. There will be persistent urge to pass stool, because the rectum has stool persistently and patient might have to use the finger to remove this, uh, this stool. So th this can happen if there is an inorectum uh, incoordination. And these are the four important manifestations of inorectal uh, disorders. It can also happen that we know that uh, the whole corner has to move uh, to stool to come to the rectum. And if somehow if there is an inertia in the colon, if it's inertia and there's a lot of stool will, will get uh, accumulated, but it can't be propelled to the rectum because of uh, uh, because of uh, uh, in colonic inertia, and therefore rectum will remain empty. If rectum will remain empty, there won't be urge to pass stool, and 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 the, therefore uh, therefore they can have uh, no urge to pass stool. So what is constipation? The classical difference of constipation, which we know for a long time, is passing less than three bowel movements per week, less than three stools per week, which are spontaneous, this is called uh, classical definition. But uh, every person has a different perception, a person in terms that if you ask people who will come to you uh, with a complaint of constipation, that they would pass, they would complain that I pass hard stool. My stool is not of good volume, I don't pass, com I still I feel that the, uh, my volume is not good. I don't have bubble movement every day, I don't have bubble movement in the morning or they could be feeling of incomplete evacuation and uh, any many people will complain constipation for any abnormal wellness they, they they have lack of terms they have lack of vocabulary therefore they would all they'll say that anything in the abdomen they will say constipation so this is what we call is a self-diagnosed constipation so many people in our in, in our society will have these symptoms and they would diagnose themselves that they have constipation and this is how they come to us so if you look at uh, uh, how many people will have this kind of perception that they have a uh, constipation and this is data from West that about 40, 14 to 45 percent uh, people in the population uh, perceive that they have constipation and the same data is there from our country uh, from a study by Dr. Ghosal which is a multi-center study and uh, where almost 50 percent people said that uh, they're not patients they are they are healthy people but they said they had constipation and then the other study from Chandigarh which, which say that 24 percent has self-perceived constipation but if you apply definition of constipation which is by Rome 3 or Rome 4 then you find that only 11 percent or, or 3 percent have constipation there's a huge gap people perceive that they have constipation but if you apply criteria for constipation only 10 percent have constipation 
and and furthermore furthermore that one third of people who don't complain but you apply criteria for uh, constipation they will find they will find that they have constipation so they don't complain they are not health seekers in our society so question comes how do i distinguish that this is a perceived constipation or this is true constipation and this is a basic question we need to understand uh, once we approach a patient with uh, constipation so for that you have we have two points to, to, to discuss the first one is a symptom complex what is the kind of symptom the person has other one is a stool characteristics what is stool characteristics again the room definition for constipation that the person must have at least two or more of the following six two or more of the following six and this will be there at least one third time of uh, or defecation and what are these less than three bowel movements per week this will be straining, lumpy or hard stool, sensation of incomplete evacuation, sensation of blockage of stool, that stool can't pass, and uh, min manual evacuation. So any two of these uh, in 30% of, of time of defecation, uh, they qualify for constipation. Furthermore, this should be uh, onset to be at least for three months. Uh, so it will be a chronic symptom rather than an acute symptom. Now coming to other characteristics, so we have a six symptom lasting for uh, at least two of them for last in, in at least one third of defecation and other one is two characteristics and there are the two points. All of us know the rectum is the driver of frequency. The defecation reflex starts from rectum. If rectum is irritable, for example, in what happens in IBD or in IPS, they will have diarrhea. If rectum is not moving, rectum has no sensation. Therefore, if rectum has no sensation, therefore, uh, there won't be uh, onset of uh, defecatory reflex. So rectum will keep uh, dilating and that can lead to constipation. And second, longer the stool stay in the colon or rectum, the water will be absorbed from, from the stool and they become hard and dry. And hard and dry stool is difficult to pass. And how do we know that? We know by looking at stool characteristics. And I think uh, there's need of change in practice out here. And we believe, and everybody believes, uh, those uh, who are the world experts in constipation, that using Bristol chart is extremely important and give a hell of amount of information uh, while making uh, an approach to a patient with constipation. So type four is a normal type of uh, uh, stool. Type, if the stool stays longer, it will become dry. Dry stool will break. They become sausage and there's a lot of breakage and it can even, it can become pellet like. They break and form small pellets. So type one, type two, which are a separate heart lumps or sausage separate, this is a constipation. Many people will say that I pass stool like this, but still they'll complain constipation. And so therefore, the patient may have different perception, but if you use this chart, it will tell us that there is a defect in in the uh, somewhere in the GI tract which leads to persistent of stool in the in the colon or rectum for a long time so please use Bristol stool chart and they can be easily used when they are all available on internet you can take a print and keep in in outpatient and maintaining stool diary sometimes uh, does help that to what kind of stool person is passing and this really helps in optimizing therapy if you, would th you give therapy patient have this, still have this kind of uh, this kind of stool in that case, you will advise uh, or add on more therapy. So those who have perceived constipation means those who don't meet the criteria of Rome 3, a stool is not that kind of, uh, as we described, uh, the Bristol stool, they don't need any investigation. They just require uh, our reassurance. We need to educate them. And this is the, this is the point of, I want to make out here, this is the point uh, which will help. At least we know 50% have a, perception, 10% have true constipation. It means 40% have perceived constipation and all those 40% is a large number can be treated just by reassuring them. Increase, ask them to increase the fruits and vegetables and also utilize a gastrocolonic reflex. We know that gastrocolonic reflex is important that once a person eats, there is a colonic contraction that's called gastrocolonic, uh, uh, gastrocolonic reflex. So ask the person to go to bowel, go to toilet or washroom and try defecation for at least five minutes uh, twice a day after major meals, uh, 30 minutes after eating. And even there's no urge. So these patients will be requested to go to washroom after their major meals uh, within half an hour 
uh, even there's no urge. And probably they will learn uh, from this and the, the, the consummation may get better. So the first point, that most of the patients have a perceived constipation, only a small number have true constipation, and the treatment is uh, counseling, education, and utilization of uh, gastrocolonic reflux. Moving to second part, that is, uh, how do we classify constipation? Renal constipation is caused by a disease in the small intestine, large intestine, or anorectum. The disease of small intestine does not lead to constipation unless there is a stricture in the small intestine. But the constipation means mainly large intestine and anorectum. So constipation can easily occur if there is obstruction uh, to the flow uh, or, or, or in, the, in the tube, uh, there is obstruction by either by tumor or inflammation, there will be constipation. And they are typical organic disease. If the colon, colon wall does not move, and if there is no propulsion because of myopathy or neuropathy, so the, the stool will not move from one part of colon to other part of colon and therefore uh, this can occur also because, both because of organic diseases like, uh, like uh, uh, myopathies or neuropathies or by uh, functional nature also. If there is a defective in rectum we just discussed, uh, there could be pelvic floor dyssynergia and in many people there is a constipation, there is true constipation but not demonstrable uh, uh, etiology and they are typical functional constipation. So organic, we all we know that any kind of obstructive lesion, mitotic lesion, a solitary rectal ulcer, proctitis, fecalitis, all can lead to uh, 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 constipation. And and the second group is once there is a, any amount of myopathy or neuropathy, either primary or secondary. Secondary means those have diabetes, those are hypothyroidism, those are hypercalcemia. There is a, a myopathy, uh, and therefore that can lead to propulsion in, in the defective propulsion in the colon, and therefore constipation. One must remember that these disorders, these disorders have a huge spectrum. The, to start with, when the colon does not move, they will not have classical symptom of no urge to pass stool, but uh, they will behave like irritable bowel syndrome or, or functional constipation. But as time pass by, months and years, they lead to chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction. So all these patients have chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction, they'll come to us uh, with uh, uh, constipation as the prime symptom uh, say a couple of years uh, before. So as I said, uh, if there is a defective propulsion, so the stool will not come to the rectum, rectum will remain in, empty and therefore they won't be asked to pass stool. And same same pathophysiology, this is what we call slow transit constipation. It means the transit is slow in the colon, therefore, therefore there is a constipation. And this is a very important disorder uh, which you need to understand. And, and, and this can lead to chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction. The second point uh, is, is a defective anorectum. Again, this is very important to understand that how it happens. So for, the, for this, we have a, a stool in the rectum, but again, there's a defective, uh, there's a defective propulsion and the stool doesn't come pass completely. It gets obstructed because of incomplete uh, relaxation of uh, 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 external anal sphincter, which is a condition called anismus. If there is a com incomplete relaxation of inorectal sphincter, this is called anismus or pelvic floor dyssynergia, and therefore there will be obstructive defecation. Again, the, you know, symptoms will still be hard, dry, they will be straining, there will be persistent urge, and there will be manual ev evacuation. This condition is also called earlier as fecal evacuation disorder or obstructive defecation. So, what a type of constipation? We discuss functional or organic. Majority of constipation are functional, 80% are functional, only 20% are organic. And among the functional, we have a three types. Normal transit, which is typical functional constipation or we can IBS constipation type. We have slow transit, where colon does not move. And we have pelvic floor dyssynergia. And more importantly, there's always a combination of uh, uh, any of these, uh, uh, and they can come as a combination. In organic, we know we have mechanical, we have drugs, and we have it systemic causes. So the for second part, majority of constipation are functional, 20% organic, and this could be normal transit, slow transit, and pelvic floor dyssynergia. Moving to the third aspect, which is also extremely important, no patient factors. And what are these factors? Sitting is important, age, higher age, low food intake because of uh, any cause. Some, somebody has a, uh, advanced mitosis, 
they will have low food intake therefore there will be constipation then there is no enough stool to induce constipation or uh, induce defecation reflex there could be multiple underlying conditions medical conditions uh, can also induce there could be multiple drugs immobility depression and all of these either they are the primary cause of constipation or they can modify the severity suppose somebody had IPS and if they start taking drug for depression the symptom of uh, uh, constipation will increase in increase in severity so this could be either sole cause or they could be modifier of for constipation coming to what are the disorders which is a systemic disease which can lead to constipation we all know uh, multiple uh, endocrinopathies some like diabetes hypothyroidism hypercalcemia or or even uh, chronic renal failure can lead to uh, constipation anybody who has a central nervous system disease or peripheral nervous system disease can also induce constipation either as a modifier or as a primary cause and we all of, of us know about it multiple drugs especially those if you prescribe iron opiates anti parkinson's drug or anti convulsants all of these can induce uh, or increase severity of uh, constipation uh, immobility fractures uh, bed uh, uh, bedridden uh, cognitive impairment spinal cord diseases all will be either modifier or could be a sole cause of uh, constipation i want to make one more point out here that uh, if there is a small polyp or tumor in the colon they will be totally asymptomatic but as time passes by and the tumor increases in size the the symptom will keep appearing slowly slowly and there could be a time when there will be complete const complete constipation obstruction and therefore constipation so one must remember that uh, uh, any on onset constipation or worsening of pre-existing constipation especially in elderly must be given a due importance and they must be investigated so for third step we need to keep in mind the setting of the patient the patient's age comorbid illness and the, how rapid the constipation severity has increased rapid this increase in severity simply means this is an organic disease and this person surely requires investigation now moving to uh, the uh, fourth step that is the map the disease and how do you map the disease answer a uh, five clinical question and all are to be done at bedside or in our outpatient clinic they don't require this mapping disease does not require any investigation first is it functional or organic we know 80 percent are functional 20 are organic so the first question comes at is it functional or organic and some of the pointer they're not telltale signs but there's some of the pointer that this is a functional constipation but if there's a long-standing symptom if there's no uh, no weight loss no fever if there's no bleeding there's no mass uh, palpable if there's no history of obstruction intestinal obstruction and if somebody had a associated bladder dysfunction and also age of onset so if we have a these same setting then it's most likely to be functional but again remember that organic disease if person has will not be long-standing so those symptoms uh, we must which points what organic that new onset symptoms weight loss anorexia bleeding manifestation fever and family history of chronic, chronic malignancy are the pointer toward organic disease. So this point should help us deciding in our clinic that this is a functional or organic as a predominant type. And if it is functional, then look at if, if it is irritable bowel syndrome. If it is irritable bowel syndrome, which is uh, now either use ROM3 or ROM4 criteria, and where constipation is associated with abdominal pain and all these should get if there's a constipation should get relieved by defecation so so if you use rom 3 criteria you will so or rom 4 criteria you will know this is a ibs now coming to a uh, important point that uh, if somebody has a constipation prolonged straining excessive straining distal evacuation feeling of obstruction in the pelvis or heaviness in the perineum so if there are any of these they, they point towards pelvic furniture and this is again important that we must ask this question the patient will not know and will not tell us at these points but we as a clinician to understand the pathophysiology we need to ask these questions and these questions are the pointer to tell us if the person has a pelvic for dyspnea so now, now we know organic disease we have pointers 
But in functional disease, we, we talked about three conditions, normal transit constipation, slow transit constipation, and pelvic floor dyssynergia. Question, how do I distinguish these two, these three? And, and this is a very important clinical, uh, uh, clinical question which all of us has in our clinical practice. And to do that, I would, I would uh, uh, take your attention to two important things, one symptom, one sign. And will this will differentiate between uh, three of these conditions, one symptom and one sign. What is symptom? And symptom is uh, simple. Uh, I, I made a point earlier that urge to pass stool is the, one of the very important clinical symptoms which classifies a constipation. Suppose if there is a slow transit constipation, if there's myopathy or neuropathy, colon is not moving, there's a chronic inertia, the colon is therefore rectum will remain empty. If this rectum empty, where is the urge? If urge starts from or defecation starts from rectum sensitivity. If there's a rectal hyposensitivity, there won't be urge. Like for example, megacolon. So slow transit constipation patient will say, I pass to every seven days, I don't have urge. And those people who have a stool uh, has to go, go to washroom every fourth or fifth day or sixth day or even longer, they are not IBS for sure. They are slow transit constipation and these patients require investigation. Suppose somebody has a, a, a whole rectum is full of stool but there's a defect in, a defect in evacuation uh, coordination. That's called inorectal incoordination defect either because of uh, incomplete relaxation of inner, external anal sphincter or internal anal sphincter, if there is a, a lack of relaxation of, uh, of uh, puberty muscle, if there's muscles are weak, especially elderly people, then they, they, this angle will not change and therefore they will be, they will be rectum will be full, they will have incomplete evacuation, and they will have persistent urge. Every time they feel there's an urge to pass tool. Urge to pass tool which is persistent, tells us that is a pelvic or distance yeah. and normal transit will have a normal urge to pass tool. So please remember urge to pass tool is a very important sign and it can different at least we can make these two diagnoses uh, on clinical ground. And one sign that's some, one sign which all forget to do a, as a gastroenterologist or a physician to do a digital little examination and this again point is important uh, because uh, if there is a inorectal defect if there is a not relaxation of inner sphincter, uh, external or internal, uh, they, how do I do that? Suppose you put a finger in the patient's rectum and, and by doing a PR, and uh, what happens at, the, at this index finger, at this index finger, uh, on the distal phalanx, you will feel the pressure of a sphincter. And ask, ask the person to defecate over your finger. So once he defecates, which is normal, the sphincter will relax and they, therefore you will find that there is less pressure on your index finger. But paradoxically, it can constrict because of uh, external sphincter. Rather than relaxing during defecation, uh, during attempted defecation, there will be increased pressure on your index finger. You know for sure this is a, a defect in relaxation of in external anal sphincter. Therefore, this is a pelvic floor disorder. So doing a paper examination is an important, especially to distinguish if the person has a, a pelvic floor dyssynergia. And it is seen that uh, by just by doing a distal rectal, you can diagnose 73% compared to manometry. Therefore, some people call this is a golden finger. DRE is now called golden finger in terms of constipation. So one more point with this clinical, we come to who needs investigation. And we know 80% functional, 20% organic. So those people who have a science of organic disease, like weight loss, anorexia, low hemoglobin, bleeding per rectum, fever, and if they have a mix with diarrhea, all these patients will require investigation because they point towards an organic disease. And, and if they have features of pelvic dyssynergia or if they have features of slow transit constipation, means no urge to pass tool or post urge to pass tool, they would require investigation. I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. So for this uh, fourth uh, step, map the disease, classify if there's a slow transit, pelvic floor, IBS, or organic, to urge to pass tool and distal rectal examination and filter out patients who require investigations. I think I'll stop here and uh, uh, we can take some questions.
Dr. Saraswat and Dr. Bhatt. Well, uh, Govind, thank you for a very crisp yeah. and elusive. Govind, there are some questions here. Uh, some, there are a couple of questions asking about in Indian patients, because our diets are different, should we have a different uh, kind of uh, sort of uh, criteria to define it as constipation? Or do we just use the Western criteria? Uh, it's not really Western criteria, but it's not, you know that uh, uh, the study has just come from, which is a multi-center study with the Uday Kursal also part of that. So probably that criteria will apply to us. I'm not sure that uh, we will need to change our definition uh, because of our dietary pattern. Certainly we take more fibers, so therefore we should have more frequency rather than less frequency. So defining the area will be still different, but constipation I think uh, uh, should be. And also we know that uh, the criteria of the criteria of constipation is not only the number of stool, there are other parameters. There are six parameters on which you decide constipation. For example, straining, the, the, the feeling of obstruction, menu evacuation. So if any two of them are there, you will define constipation. So it's not just the three spontaneous bowel movements per week. There are more criteria that we need to apply. Absolutely, sir. Right? Yeah. The other thing is that you said straining. Now, someone wants to know from uh, Patna, Dr. Ravikant wants to know, straining is it just a subjective criterion or do you have some kind of definition as to how long it sits in the toilet or whatever? I'm not too sure about it. Uh, but straining is a subjective criteria. It's not objective. Patient tells that I have to strain. And this is no, somebody has to stay in the washroom for half an hour. It's, it might mean that this patient have a, a pelvic floor dysonancia or, or even a slow transit. But why the person has to stay? If there's an urge to pass stool, if it's going to washroom to pass stool, I has to wait for so long. It means there's some, some defect uh, in the pathophysiology. The defect is the so rectum is empty, therefore, but he going to washroom as a normal, and, but uh, there's nothing can come out because there's no stool in the rectum. Or, or, or there's a persistent uh, lot of stool, but it can't evacuate because of a defect in, in rectal uh, coordination. Another question is, uh, should we consider dysenergic defecation as functional or can it be organic as well? Uh, this question is from Dr. Siddesh from Bangalore. Dr. Siddesh, uh, uh, this could be both organic, organic and functional. Simply, somebody has an anal fissure. So, this person will not want to go to pass stool because there's a lot of pain. Passes the stool leads to pain. So, those who have anorectal uh, organic disease, especially either there is an anal carcinoma or, or if there is an uh, uh, active fissure, then they'll behave like pelvic for dysenergia. But otherwise, most of them are functional. Two questions on clinical uh, thing is, one of them wants to know, where is the Neeraj from Hyderabad? Wants to know, where is the site of pain in patients of constipation? And another question from Dr. Ajay from Rijikesh. He says, there's a lot of family history that we find in these patients. Uh, do you think there may be genetic factors or is it just dietary factors? Okay, two very important questions. And the first one, that pain, where the pain is? So if there's an organic disease, if there is a, uh, some kind of obstruction, then most people will have pain in the central abdomen. At uh, that point, it was organic. But other one is like feeling of heaviness, or feeling of because the rectum is full, and therefore a person will have a, uh, that feeling of pain or discomfort is more in the lower, lower abdomen, because there lies the rectum, or in the pelvis. So they will have a heaviness in the perineum or lower abdomen. Uh, if there is an obstructive type of defecation, but otherwise it could be central. And we know the IBS patient's pain will have a both mid-abdomen and lower abdomen. The coming to second part uh, was, uh, uh, what is the question, just you know, one point? Family history. Family history. Family history. The, all this behavior of uh, bowel movement and constipation is familiar. And this is one of the important determinants of uh, constipation in our society. We know that uh, uh, everybody, most Indian will believe that all disease starts in abdomen. And they would see that any element they have, they start, all, everything is a, my pate is a, a region for everything. If a person sees his father goes to washroom twice a day, morning and evening, the, the son learns from his childhood, or daughter learns from childhood, that had to pass to every, two day, every twice every day. And that becomes a habit. So family is, may not be genetic in nature, genetic for some disorders, but more of a learned behavior since early part of life that they 
they relate the same with so the four, those family have a constipation as a symptom meaning the family will say the constipation as a symptom for any abnormal alveolus they come with symptom of constipation okay one last question before you move to the next phase we'll take up the other questions later uh, this is a question from says what are the causes of normal transit constipation why do they get constipated so again uh, this is really not known so look at a typical example is ibs or functional constipation functional ones we don't find the two point I want to make here, uh, and there's a lot of confusion about it, functional constipation and, and IBS. IBS, three types, IBS constipation, IBS diarrhea, IBS mixed or undifferentiated. So those who have a pain, we call it IBS. Those who don't have pain, we call it functional constipation in the, in the ambit of, uh, of uh, functional bowel disease. Therefore, but there are studies available in those functional constipation and IBS that in some the chronic manometry, uh, chronic motility is low, in some it's even fast, but it's not really no, uh, not known. More important is a perception, and one of the basic pathophysiology of uh, IBS or functional constipation is a perception. The rectum is uh, uh, slightly less sensitive, therefore it does not induce uh, the uh, does induce the defecation and reflex, and therefore patient feels constipation. I think we'll move on to the next part of your talk and take up, there are plenty of questions. We'll come back to them uh, in subsequently. Thank you, Kobe. Just go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. And then we can move to uh, our fifth strategy that is, uh, that is uh, treat and optimize. And before you treat to optimize, uh, uh, we left at uh, uh, who, who needs investigation. So what are the investigation? Uh, we, we filtered patients who require investigation. We know those who have organic disease. Those who have a pelvic floor dyssynergia, those who have a serotransit, will require some investigation. So, what investigation? So, mapping the disease, uh, uh, we need to know that uh, uh, that uh, if there are alarm features, if there is rapid worsening, if there is new onset symptom, in, especially in elderly, and if there is obstructive defecation, then it means this is an inflammatory or mitotic disease, and surely this patient will require a uh, industrial examination, either sigmatoscopy or colonoscopy, or depend or CT intergraphy, depending upon what your clinical differential diagnosis here. So these patients will certainly require investigation, depending upon uh, what other clinical features are there. So those patients who have a no urge to pass stool, they have constipation for a long time. They pass stool every sixth, seventh day, or fifth day, and this they don't pass stool. They require high dose of uh, 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 laxatives, and they come after uh, years of uh, consultation at many places. Uh, most likely they will have a slow transit constipation and this could be because of uh, diabetes, hypothyroidism induced myopathy or many other such conditions and therefore we need to survey systematic disease, systemic diseases. Uh, for slow transit we talk about uh, uh, colonic transit studies and this patient will also require colonoscopy to rule out uh, any obstruction and ultimately if the facilities we want to really map that what is the defect in colonic motility. For those who have persistent urge to pass stool, you think of uh, uh, pelvic floor dyssynergia. We need to do two things to know. We want to know pelvic floor function and pelvic floor structure. For look at function, we want to do uh, high resolution uh, endorectal manometry. We want to look at rectal sensation and look at structure. We want to do defecography, which could be either barium or MRI based defecography. And those who have IBS or functional constipation, they may not require any specific investigation. At best, depending upon, you might do a uh, sigmoidoscopy, but otherwise, uh, certainly hemoglobin and ESR to be done to look at if they are underlying. And I must point here again that uh, all these disease, uh, the first, they all pass through a spectrum, and all these will qualify for diagnosis of IBS. So one, keep in mind that which IBS will require investigation is our clinical sense. So coming first to a transit study, again, I t tell you the principle of transit study. If you give uh, radiopic markers uh, to these patients, uh, if there is a pelvic dyssynergia, you find all the markers are here in the, in the rectum, and they are due to pass, this is called pelvic dyssynergia. If they're spread all, out, all over, this is slow transit constipation, and normal should not have it. Yes. So this is the five-day protocol, and uh, uh, the Kosala has published that Indians have a faster transit, so you can do x-ray at 60 hours. So this will test tells us that uh, what this patient could have. And this can also be assessed by uh, nuclear scans also. 
Second point, how do we assess pelvic floor? Again, as said, that uh, we, what we want to know, we want to know about anal sphincter, their normal tone, how they relax during process of defecation. We want to look at symmetry of sphincter. We want to look at uh, a coordination between sphincter and rectum. By, by If rectum contracts, the external anal sphincter should relax or internal sphincter should relax. And this is a, uh, this is a recto anal inhibitory reflex, uh, which, is, which we see in uh, either manometry or even in distal rectal examination. In, even in distal rectal examination, we can look at the recto anal inhibitory reflex. And if this is absent, then we know this is a Hirschman's disease. We also look at rectal sensation by, by inflating the balloon in the rectum and look at, at what volume the patient has sensation of uh, now feeling of uh, the balloon which you are inflating and when you have pain. So these points tells us about uh, so in, in this all can be found in by doing a in reclaminometry. And to look at the structure, we want to look at what happens with the in angle during defecation, how much is the pelvic floor should descend, normally should descend about three centimeter. Uh, so this we get to know by barium or MR diffography. And all this could be screened. So the pelvic floor, if you suspect pelvic floor dysenergia, this could be screened by doing a test called balloon expulsion test. And balloon expulsion test, it means you put a catheter in the rectum and ask the person to bear down. If person bears down this inflated balloon from rectum within one minute, this is a normal. Now this person, you can say that this person does not have pelvic floor dysenergia. And this can be done even at uh, uh, places where there's no manometry facility available, uh, putting a, taking a tube, rise tube, putting in balloon, and then that you can do that. Now, in manometry, uh, there are some characteristics of pelvic floor dysenergia. And uh, so, you would like to do manometry in those patients who have a, a clinical diagnosis of uh, pelvic floor dysenergia. It means they have a straining, they have menu evacuation, they have a feeling of incomplete evacuation and persistent urge. If they are there, you will think this patient have, have a pelvic floor dysenergia and therefore you might refer this patient for manometry. And in interrectal men manometry, uh, we have uh, four types. And I just, just to point again that for during normal, if there is increased rectal distension because of a good amount of stool and person bears down, the anal sphincters will relax. Right? So rectal contraction, anal sphincter relaxation, the two main uh, factors. This is a push force from, from above, the rectum contracts and endless sphincter relax and that leads to defecation. What happens uh, if you find the rectum is contracting, because we see a red zone here, red means uh, high pressure, the person is contracting, he's passing his tool, trying to pass tool, but the anal sphincter rather than becoming low, this would be yellow or blue, uh, uh, this is a high, red represents high pressure. So while the person is attempting defecation, the anal sphincters are not opening up. They are, the pressure rises. That's called paradoxical, con paradoxical contraction of anal sphincter. This is a pelvic floor dysenergia type 1. And this is one of the most common type of pelvic floor dysenergia. And there are other three types also, but this is the most important type. It means the push force is there, but anal sphincter does not relax. And we can know the, we want to know the whole process of defecation. We do a defecography, which could be MR. MR is much better than barium, barium defecography. Uh, MR can, and now MR defecography is available uh, at many, many places. And there we look at the uh, inorectal angle, uh, the opening of inorectal angle. Uh, you look at uh, uh, descent of uh, uh, the pelvic floor, and based on that, you will decide there is uh, any amount of abnormality. And you can also look at uh, prolapse of uh, uh, rectum in this uh, defecography. So this is again important investigation. Every lesion have a spectrum. No lesion have a full-blown disease at one time. They pass through multiple phases and, and they can present any point of time. So as a clinician, we must remember the spectrum of manifestation. If you remember the top, uh, the most classical manifestation, there will be end stage disease. And, uh, and uh, they're easy to make a diagnosis because the symptoms are very classical, but uh, the opportunity to treat are much less here. The, in, in advanced disease is just to palliation. 
So one need to, as a clinician, we need to understand the whole spectrum of manifestation. For example, again, look at this person who has a small polyp converted into malignancy, and over time, the tumor increases in size. Early lesion may just look like a functional constipation, but with time, this, this tumor becomes more symptomatic. He may come at this stage when there is a small lesion, he may come at advanced stage when you're sure that there is a large obstructive lesion because symptoms are quite remarkable here. More constipation, bleeding per rectum, feeling of there's a clinical obstruction. We are happy to make a diagnosis here, but this is an advanced stage of disease. We, we, we'll be happy, more happy to diagnose this disease at this stage where I have more opportunity to treat this person. And one also remember that those patients who have a defective myopathy or a neuropathy disorder from smooth muscle, uh, before they become classical chronic obstructive obstruction or uh, pseudo obstruction, they always have phase when they have a slow transit type constipation or they can present just like IBS. And now we have Indian guidelines on constipation, uh, which is led by Dr. Uday Ghosal and this is published last year in our journal. So one would like to read his article. Now, so we, so with this, we mapped the disease, we met clinically and we did an appropriate investigation. Now coming to how do you treat and optimize therapy. So as usual, the first one is educate and reassure them, increase bulk and utilize gastrocolonic reflex. Just to repeat again, that attempt, ask the patient to attend bowel movement for five minutes, uh, twice a day after major meals, at 30 minutes after eating, uh, even there's no urge. And modify the modifiable patient factors, which is again important. There's some drug is causing constipation, maybe try to send the drug to other class, likewise. So principal constipation are three principles mainly, that you need to have patent tract, which is mainly organic. So the tract should be patent, this will be in good amount of bulk of stool, small bulk will have difficult to pass stool and this will have good amount of water content. Dry stool is difficult to pass and difficult to move. So this will be a good amount of water content in the stool. This will be adequate intestinal motility and this will be appropriate difficulty appraise. And all these pathophysiological abnormalities which we detected, which we discussed earlier, will, will, will decide what treatment patients should receive. Coming first to appropriate stool bulk and water content, which is the prime of therapy, which is the first line treatment of constipation or laxatives. And, and here we have first line drugs and we have second line drugs. The first line, the bulking agents, the hypersmolar agents, the, the colonic stimulants, the stool softener so that the stool can pass easily, lubricants and enemas. So these are the first line therapy. I think all of us know about it. And we have second line, which are newer drugs. There's a uh, where, where we can put more water in the, into the colon and increase motility in the colon. We'll come back to each one of them uh, uh, in quick succession. Coming to the bulking agent, so more fibers to the diet and to the, uh, we can add as a, uh, as a supplement. But please remember one point that Indians have already have a good amount of dietary fibers. Uh, they already have about 40-50 uh, uh, grams of fiber per day against the recommendation of 30 to 40 grams of fiber. Against the recommendation of 30 to 40 grams of fiber, people are only taking more fiber. So giving more fiber may do more worse to symptoms because these fibers can lead to blotting, flatulence and other defects. So fiber is not therapy for all constipation. One need to know that if the personal fiber intake is low, you add fibers. Then we have a hypersmolar agents. Uh, one of them uh, is a polyethylene glycol, which uh, are come at 17 grams sachet. And this is a, a good drug because this will increase uh, uh, the content, water content of stool and therefore the e easy to pass stool. One can use lactose also, but lactose also has a side effect of soup test. Stimulants are uh, not very commonly used. Uh, those who have a slow transit type constipation, one can use bisacogel or one can use sodium sulfate. And I believe these two are uh, wonderful drugs for uh, treating slow transit constipation. And many people use Senna. Uh, Sena is uh, uh, mainly once you, you must be uh, seeing that a lot of patients take a Kayam Chun, which also has a Sena in it. Then one can use uh, uh, lubricants like uh, we can use paraffin, you can use magnesium. And one of the example is where you can use uh, uh, any, any kind of preparation which has a, a paraffin, uh, liquid paraffin, which helps in propulsion of the stool and certainly animals. So, so 
So this, we need to increase the stool bulk and water content. But other thing, the new thing which has come up for the last uh, couple of years uh, is, uh, or a couple of, uh, I would say one decade, uh, is uh, uh, the measures where you increase water in the colon uh, by two methods. Either you inhibit water absorption in the colon or add more water to the colon uh, by, by some drugs. We know that a lot of people believe that I take two liters, of, two liters of water per day before I go to, or say I take two glass of water before, after getting in the morning and I go to washroom. But this water is, uh, taking, taking uh, with meal or without meal or even the, at morning time will lead to increased gastrocolonic reflex. Therefore, you are inducing uh, the bowel movement, movement by inducing gastrocolonic reflex. But this water will be absorbed in the jejunum or ileum. So this water will never reach colon, which is our purpose. We want more water in the colon. But taking more water intake through mouth will not increase water in the colon because this will be absorbed. Therefore, you use polyethylene glycol, which is not absorbed, which uh, because of osmotic effect, it goes in the, in, in the colon. But how do we do that? Still, how do we do that? So there are ways to do that. So if you, for that, we need to know the receptors and uh, which are there on introcyte. So this is introcyte. On, on introcyte, we have uh, multiple receptors. We are aware that there's a CFTR receptor, there's a chloride channels, and these uh, two receptors will in, will, we, will release chloride into the lumen from the introcyte. So therefore, once chloride comes out, the sodium comes out, water comes out. So these are called calcium channel activators. So this is one of the methods uh, which have been, uh, which have been uh, used uh, to, to make new drugs for uh, putting more water in the colon. One can also increase motility of uh, uh, intestine by using prokinetics. So what are these drugs? Let's come to these drugs. So we have a chloride channel activator, chloride channel activator is a lubiprostone. We have, a, uh, we have a other drugs, for example, they increase a cyclic GMP. Uh, in the intracyte, these drugs are linocrotide and uh, pelicanotide, and these drugs lead to cyclic EMP and leads to more chloride secretion in the uh, lumen and therefore more water secretion in the lumen. So what are the chloride channel, chloride channel activators? We have two drugs, lubiprostone, which increases uh, the stool, uh, inputs more water into the colon, and therefore it improves the GI tract motility. And uh, this drug has been found to be effective in terms of uh, increasing, decreasing severity of constipation, improving stool consistency, improving pain, improving straining, and improving no distension. And this is now uh, one of the important drugs for uh, important drugs for constipation. The dose for this uh, in functional. 24 microgram twice a day, and in IBS is 8 microgram uh, twice a day. Uh, certainly, this duct must not be used if you suspect uh, mechanical GI obstruction and should not be used in pregnancy. The other drug is uh, uh, this drug is available in our country. I think many of you must be using it. The other drug is uh, a linaclotide, which increases a uh, cyclic GMP and therefore leads to activation of uh, CFTR and chloride channels. Therefore, put more water in the colon. Again, this drug also has found to be efficacious compared to uh, placebo. The other drug which is not available in our country, this is a, a polycanotide. Two RCTs, uh, better than placebo, but again, look at response is just 20%. So certainly it will have a high number to treat if you use uh, this drug. Other new drug which is uh, uh, coming up, this is called uh, sodium hydrogen Action inhibitor, so tenapenor, and this is a, looks to be a, a good drug. This is not available, uh, is not approved till now. But one study in IBS constipation type uh, in 356 patients, two studies in fact, and shows that uh, it improves constipation in 61% of patients. So this is a likely to be an important drug uh, in the portfolio of constipation. Third principle of treatment: improve intestinal motility. So we know that uh, uh, if you improve, if you have a five, uh, so histamine is important uh, component, 5-HT is important component, which improves motility. And there are multiple types of histamines that's called uh, uh, multiple type three and four. So this 5-HT4 agonist, the many drugs, that's cisapride, tegosride, which are now banned. The new drugs are plucaloparide and neronapride. So these drugs are uh, becoming an important drugs in the portfolio of constipation. 
Procolopride available as 1 milligram, 2 milligram, or 4 milligram. In, in our country, it's available as 1 milligram and 2 milligram, but it is agonist of 5-ST4 uh, receptors, so therefore it improves cholinic motility. And, and uh, summary of uh, uh, two, six phase 2 and phase 3 studies uh, using uh, Procolopride. If you look at uh, more than three stools, it varies from 12 to 56 percent. And uh, now the one phase four studies over six months so was 21 percent patient have a improvement in their symptoms. Other drug that we know the bile salts, if it's not absorbed, then leads to diarrhea. So if you if you block the bile salt transporter in the in the large intestine, uh, that can lead to more water in the so more salt bile salt in the stool, therefore more water more water in the colon. Therefore uh, this. Uh, method have been used and uh, this is a bile acid transport inhibitor and the drug is uh, uh, ilobixet and this drug uh, is efficacious in 22 percent compared to 10 percent in placebo this drug is still not available so which doctor so many drugs which doctor choose we have two ways to look at it either we have a data based upon head-to-head -head comparison or network meta-analysis i'll come back to that uh, so looking at uh, what is the number in treat, which are the good drugs. So this is a, a pool of uh, many studies that if you're using osmotic agent or stimulant, the NNT is just to, you have to treat, uh, uh, to get benefit in treat three patients, polyethylene glycol, much better. You treat uh, about two and a half patients, one patient will get better. Levoprostone, NNT is four, and Procolopride, NNT is six. So the, still now, uh, in garden variety constipation, our usual laxatives, uh, they, they are better. And these drugs are to be used in, because they have to use more patient to get benefit. So these drugs are to be used in special situations. And I'll come back to that uh, on a, in an algorithm. And now we have a data that we, uh, network meta-analysis. It means that all the drugs have been tested. Uh, they're, they're not comparison directly, but they're indirect comparison. Uh, using network uh, meta-analysis and here we find that uh, the drug uh, diphenylmethane laxative basically these are bisacodyl and sodium picosulfate uh, they are found to be the best drug at four weeks at four weeks data suggest that if you use either bisacodyl or sodium picosulfate uh, they are the top if they are the drug with top effect only 50 percent patient have a failure to respond means 45 percent improved their symptoms and we have a for example if you use as other drugs like for example uh, linacrotide is only 10 percent uh, benefit so 90 percent chance of uh, failure with this chance of failure is only 45 percent so they at four weeks they are the best drugs and at 12 weeks uh, at 12 weeks if you look at 12 weeks data then we have a true color pride uh, at two milligram dose uh, is supposed to be at top of all the uh, anti-constipating drugs but yet we don't have the best drug available and we will have to use uh, uh, multiple strategies strategies uh, which uh, use uh, uh, put more water in the colon and they also have a prochromatic effect either in one drug or two drug combination uh, should be strategy that you are targeting multiple sites uh, for a uh, colonic movement and uh, and also use a combination to have a synergistic effect and coming to last part that is appropriate for those who have a pelvic floor dyssynergia, uh, we have a, a treatment called biofeedback. And biofeedback where you teach uh, the defect by showing what's happening on a computer, computer screen that one patient uh, defecates, you'll see what is the, def uh, what you demonstrate them, there's a paradoxal contraction. You teach them how not to do that. And there are three principles of that. Uh, if there's a paradoxal contraction, do biofeedback. If there is a uh, impaired rectal sensation, then you train by increasing the, uh, put the balloon in the rectum and keep increasing the volume so that the rectum become more sensitive. So the, by doing biofeedback, uh, we can treat patient with pelvic floor dysynergia. So summary of this, for treatment and optimize, we have first line drugs, we have second line drugs, but more important, use, sometimes you have to use combination, if especially those who are refractory and keep rotating uh, because constipation may be for multiple years to so keep rotating laxatives in the treatment. And coming to last uh, part, the, that is a uh, uh, special situation. 
and one of the important situation is a uh, laxative uh, overuse uh, no sorry opioid overuse and this opioid can lead to constipation so in this uh, those who have opioid induced constipation uh, standard drugs can be used and they are effective in 40 to 60 percent but those patients who don't have respond to this then the other class of drug called pemoras that is a peripheral acting peripheral acting mu receptor mu opioid receptor antagonist basically antagonist to opioid receptors and the drugs which is uh, uh, relister or methyl naltexon so this can be used for opioid induced constipation recap we define slow transit constipation if there's no patency they don't buy any test diagnose ibs or functional constipation using wrong criteria thinking of slow transit no urge to pass stool stools at every four five days early it could be early could be advanced disease and here we like to use transit study or or nuclear scan pelvic floor dysenergia those who have persistent uh, straining persistent urge to pass stool pelvic uh, uh, i mean the perineal discomfort signifying pelvic floor dysenergia screening by balloon expulsion test manometry tetra sensation or defecography if combination the 30 40 percent will overlap then you will have to combine these investigations so last part summary how do you treat if you have a functional constipation use fibers polyethylene glycol or liquid paraffin if they don't respond you might use bisacodyl or sodium picosulfate you can use polychlorpride you can use uh, uh, this drug if there is a uh, if there is a uh, slow transit constipation ask them to take a lot of water to induce a gastrochronic reflex and ask them to try bowel movement after meals first line treatment for those who have slow transit constipation bisacodyl or sodium picosulfate or true calopride and try combination if they don't respond to one try combination if they don't even they don't respond you might try pyridostigmine and this drug is not really approved this we use as a part of patient care and if we have used this drug for those who are refractive constipation this is short transit type and we found this drug have an efficacy and those who have most advanced the short transit going to colonic suit obstruction then one can do surgery but this is only a rare event those who have pelvic dysynergia what not to do if you have pelvic dysynergia one thing one must not do is don't give fibers fiber is not panacea for all constipation if you give fiber to this patient you saw a picture the stool will become more in the rectum and there will be more discomfort more symptom so if you suspect pelvic dysynergia don't give fiber as a treatment for this person treatment is by feedback which may not be available everywhere but if it's available this is very effective in up to 60 to 70 percent patients now this by feedback can also be done at home which is not available in our country but in the u.s uh, people are using especially uh, dr rao uh, who is a master of uh, constipation is a world leader in constipation they have devised the home based biofeedback dr satish rao and uh, we need to teach them uh, diaphragm exercise uh, i could show these these things uh, uh, by sewing but again this is not platform i can where i can sew and they are relaxation technique if not available, defer for those centers who have biofeedback. But meanwhile, you try something which is a, a polyethylene glycol or liquid paraffin or combination uh, and modify the dose. So those who have a refractive constipation, the reason is uh, simple. We are using inappropriate doses. We are using inappropriate patients. And more importantly, we, we are probably we are using a inappropriate therapy in this patient. If I use uh, Five or four foot transit, the symptom are worse, get worse rather than getting better. And therefore, we must focus on pathophysiology, assess the cause, provide psychological assessment to these patients, and try and use combination. Modify all the modifiable factors, and still, we know that no treatment of constipation provides 100% benefit. And therefore, we need to have uh, better drugs in this. Uh, uh, in this uh, therapy lastly the constipation is a big problem for any society the person who suffer from constipation they have very poor quality of life they have millions of visits to doctors and they undergo 
a lot of investigation. If you look at the global population of say 10% uh, prevalence of constipation, we have uh, 700 million people in the world have constipation. And India itself, we have uh, 13 crore people will have constipation. And if you look at perceived constipation, the patient feel I'm constipated, almost in our own country, there will be 21 million, overall 21 million people will have a perceived constipation. So we have a lot of unmet need. We need, we need to change behavior of people. Indian people should, should, we should tell, as a physician, we should tell what is perceived, so don't worry about it, and what is true, which requires specific therapy. We need to have better understanding of disease. We should have simplified description of disease. There are a lot of confusion in the literature. Everybody has a the different classification of constipation. Therefore, the reader get confused. Therefore, we should have a simplified, simplified description of the disease and drug with better efficacy. So in summary, what I told you, that first thing, decide is a perceived constipation or a true constipation. True constipation, we need to go to next steps. The perceived constipation, counsel and utilize a gastrocolonic reflex. Classic constipation, if it's a, a true constipation, classify into functional or organic. If it's functional, we divide into normal transit, slow transit, and pelvic dyskinesia. And I told you, slow transit will have a no, no urge to pass tool, pelvic dyskinesia will have a persistent urge to pass tool, and this is how we decide. We go to patient factors, look at their age, look at the setting, comorbid illness, and more importantly, the rapidity of uh, uh, this thing. And then we map the disease, either slow transit, pelvic floor, IBS, or the organic. Use ours as a clinical parameter, and use, please use a, a digital examination, which sometimes can replace manometry, and filter who requires investigations, and do appropriate investigations. Every patient with constipation does not require investigation. Optimize by using first-line drug. If don't, second-line drugs, or use combination or rotate. And in a special situation, we have a special answers. So with this, I end my presentation and uh, maybe ask uh, uh, two questions uh, to audience as a part of interaction with uh, the audience. Number one, if I give a clinical situation, here is a 54 years old male, have constipation for the last 15 years. He passes hard and dry stool, had feeling of incomplete evacuation, and often remove the stool digitally. Which of the following drug we will prefer to avoid? Blue color pride, polyethylene glycol, fibers, or liquid paraffin. You can mark this on your, uh, the question must have popped up on. You can mark your answer, one, two, three, four. Those who are on Facebook, they can write one, two, three, four. We're giving one minute for this um, and uh, we will have some answers coming up on the screen. Um, Dinesh? Yes, sir. Do you have answer? Do you have the answer? I'm also just share an answer. Answers on your screen, sir. You can change your screen or you can read Amol, you can read the answer. You can unmute mm -hmm. and read the answer. It's 56, 57% uh, saying fibers and 22% PEG. Sir, perfect. So certainly we will not like to use fibers in this uh, subset of people uh, because fiber will further worsen uh, the constipation because this history is typical classical of uh, a pelvic floor dysenergia. Now let's go to one more question, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, have you ever been a diagnosis of pelvic floor dysenergia in your clinic? If you say yes, put one. If you say no, then put two. Those on Facebook can say yes or no by typing one or two respectively. Answers, please. Yes, sir. 61% are saying yes, and 
almost I mean, 60 40 60 so wonderful so with this i stop uh, my presentation and and my apology that uh, i didn't realize that i crossed the uh, time by little bounds okay. is almost 110 um, my due apology for uh, losing my sense of time while speaking on this topic okay. uh, i believe i think you can see your involvement and your um, uh, eagerness to teach and communicate the messages uh, govin so what we'll do now is although we have a relatively less time left we have about 15 20 uh, 15 minutes in which we'll try and take as many questions as possible so i'll start off with some questions primarily dealing with the investigations and a few questions about the mechanisms while i think the treatment related there is a large number of those questions uh, some of them i am hoping uh, dr bhat will take up in, uh, thereafter so coming to the investigations uh, dr krunal patel from jaipur as well as amit joshi from indore and a few others wish to know about the balloon expansion expulsion test in what position do you recommend should it be done what uh, and uh, whether weights are used or should be used anything about the duration uh, or, and other details about how do you normally perform a balloon expulsion test in your practice so if you do a uh, you do normal ones that normal means you put 50 ml balloon and ask the person in the left lateral position to evacuate uh, this balloon uh, and if you evacuate within 1 minute we say that the coordination between inner rectum is good and less likely this person happens for dyssynergia but sometime you put a weight and weight puts over it is half a kg and 500 mg grams and see that uh, if the person is able to if person is able to do a weighted uh, then you can always say that there is no pelvic dyssynergia right so uh, well with from over 210 questions by now to choose it's going to be difficult uh, an interesting question is from dr antariksh in chandigarh Uh, where do you place the breath test for methanobrevi bacter in the treatment of chronic constipation i think that was something that is uh, of interest absolutely yes it is important and uday khosal has uh, some work on this that uh, we know that the methane is produced in the uh, into the colon methane is a, uh, is it, it inhibits colonic motility and therefore if there is a we have a bacterial overgrowth uh, and uh, especially in the colon and if there you have a brevi vector methane i if there is a bacteria which produces more uh, methane in the colon that can lead to decreased motility and there are data now that uh, and if data from there that if you treat these patients with rifaximin uh, sometime constipation gets better certainly this has a different role that uh, methane can have a uh, defect can lead to defect in the contraction of smooth muscle and therefore Uh, one can use rifaximin in this situation is it a sizable proportion of the constipated population who have methanobacter overgrowth uh, i mean how commonly should you suspect and uh, test for this organism i'm not sure about this because uh, those who are, because uh, those who are doing uh, these studies those who have had an breath test if you do had an breath test you find there you will find methane peak and certainly those patients but again if you don't have test i don't think we have a clinical parameter to say that this patient should undergo breath testing or not otherwise uh, uh, all of them will have to undergo breath test yes so uh, now regarding pelvic floor dyssynergia uh, the question is between barium defecography and mri defecography are there any differences when would you prefer one over the other and there may be places which don't have mr will barium be sufficient there absolutely sir uh, one line answer mr is better any time better because tells you about anatomy of muscles the pelvic floor much better the coordination is much better seen on that mr mr defecography is much better compared to barium but mr defecography is difficult to do is is takes lot of time and many people may not have expertise to do this test but if available mr defecography is the answer right okay thank you uh, dr tirumala from pondicherry as well as dr rakesh from lucknow and uh, dr ravi thakur from banaras have questions regarding your you talked about slow transit constipation myopathy versus neuropathy so how to suspect and how to diagnose and what exactly is the place of a colonic biopsy in the work up of these people with the uh, presumed slow transit constipation uh, imp- important question very important question so i just said that in a common garden variety of constipation we need to filter out which are the slow transit and for pointed towards that slow transit because of myopathy or neuropathy even because of diabetes they will have huge spectrum diabetes of 5 years diabetes of 25 years 
with a different spectrum, different scale of neuropathy in them, different, different scale of myopathy in them. And if you look at primary also, the different scale. At younger age, muscle symptom, but as they grow, symptom may get worse. So there always will be spectra. So those who don't have urge to pass stool, and if, for for those people who say that I don't pass stool for five days, and even have urge to pass stool, no doubt about it. This is a slow transit constipation, and that we we should understand uh, that how far they will progress. They may, might progress to the stage when there is a chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction, late stage. But all these patients will present with a slow transit constipation. So urge to pass stool or passing stool very infrequently is the pointer to think of a slow transit constipation. Coronal biopsy in these patients probably are not very useful because whatever biopsy we take by endoscope, we just take mucosa and submucosa. We don't teach muscle layer. And therefore, doing just coronal biopsy probably will not, I mean, if you find a submucosal plexus, they are, they are, they are uh, immunohistochemistry uh, markers, but you will miss if unless you go to site of disease, that's a muscle. Unless we need muscle, we can't differentiate. Therefore, either they require open uh, biopsies uh, or this is how it is done. So, so how, how does biopsy help the management? Does it, is it important to differentiate myopathic versus neuropathic? If you are thinking of a total colectomy, is that the time when you want to do biopsies? What exactly is the place for biopsy in these people? So biopsy is done mainly in those patients, especially the early part of life. If you're thinking of Hirschsprung's disease, they would do biopsy, full thing biopsy. And then because this, it matters there. But those who have only have advanced disease, uh, no point doing biopsy there. Certainly, you, uh, it, but there are only few patients. They require maybe pan colectomy. But uh, uh, important point that why do we allow these patients to go there? Even if you pick up them early and they treat them, probably we can increase, decrease their suffering. Okay. Uh, regarding a few questions about uh, the mechanisms, uh, Dr. Shubhankar from Hyderabad wanted to know about chronic constipation in pregnancy. Is there a difference in the mechanism and are any investigations needed in that situation or how would you handle that? So, as I said, this is a very important issue that uh, constipation pregnancy is because of effective estrogen. Pregnancy is a hyperestrogenic uh, state. Therefore, there will be chronic motility may come down. Uh, may, and also, noting that the pressure of the fetus or enlarged uterus will also have bearing on the inorectal function. So therefore, but again, we don't have to use uh, 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 high fi drugs, simple using either lactulose or even polyphenol glycol will do the trick. All right. Um, uh, Dr. Achal has an interesting question. Achal is from Bangalore and he wants to know about proctalgia fugax. Is it organic or is it functional and uh, how to treat the condition, how to diagnose and treat the condition? So proctalgia fugax is a condition which is mostly functional in nature. And probably we have we thought about that we do master class on this. So we're thinking of doing this master class in the whole segment because this is an important part for all of us that how do you treat the whole spectrum? Uh, it's not only one, this is a common term like proctalgia fugax, but in that there are multiple subtypes. And probably we'll request one of uh, our experts in uh, neuromotility to talk on this. Right. Um... Regarding the sense of incomplete evacuation, which is quite commonly described in IBS of the constipation type, Dr. Jagannath from Madurai wants to know, uh, can we explain the mechanism or what, why exactly, what is the um, uh, genesis of these symptoms of in so-called feeling of incomplete evacuation? So that's oh, important, incomplete, because it is a lot of stool in the rectum and, and is not evacuated. So patient will have it because rectal pressure is high. Rectal mucosa always perceive that particular, uh, the stool is still there, despite having full bowel movement. So this is one. Number two, more important in terms of IBS is a rectal hypersensitivity. That for uh, the small amount of stool, the patient already perceives there's a something there, something there. And uh, there are two types. One is a functional hypersensitivity or visual hypersensitivity because of a functional disease like IBS. And for example, in, in IBD, because of inflammation, uh, you have a visual hypersensitivity. Therefore, you have or, Recreate urge to pass stool. You go to washroom, you hardly pass some amount of mucus or some blood, um, but no stool. And this is all because of a visceral hypersensitivity, and which is the hallmark of uh, uh, of IBS. Right. Last question before I pass the baton on to Dr. Naresh Bhatt for the next five six minutes. Uh, is very interesting question from Dr. Ajay Kumar in Rishikesh. Um, in diabetic constipation is very difficult to treat. Uh, 
are you aware or are there any developments on the use of electrical stimulation therapy or pacemaker implantations for any subset of people with chronic constipation they are certainly this not only for diabetes but also for a primary myopathy and neuropathy there are some development but again but they are not available and i'm not really updated on this uh, at this point of time i read some some papers uh, some time back but not updated myself uh, over last right. last so four years that is happening and we need to keep track of it uh, dr uh, bhat uh, can you please um, yeah. start with some questions if you yeah. have uh, there are a couple of uh, questions um, basically on perineal descent how do you really examine for perineal descent do you prefer it in the squatting position and uh, what is how do you diagnose a recto seal and what is the role of surgery in recto seal so uh, this is from monish uh, from uh, chandigarh so hi monish so this is a, a recto seal uh, is important and especially the recto seal after a child birth in our uh, in our uh, you know women uh, if they are unsupervised supervised uh, deliveries there there is a damage and rectus seal becomes also an important issue there rectus seal can be diagnosed easily on either barium or mr difficulty and the criteria that we take a normal descent is about 2 cm descent and you look at uh, uh, from the neck of femur you look at distance so there are criteria by which you will say there's a rectal prolapse but all rectal prolapse do not require surgical treatment and i want to emphasize time and again here that rectal prolapse may be a modifier may not be sole cause and if you do surgery in these patients prematurely we are going to worsen their symptom uh, rather than making them any better so only those patients who have advanced disease we tried enough of a uh, treatment and their rectal prolapse is quite large only in that small or prolapse probably should be left alone uh, there are a couple of questions on uh, normal transit constipation professor vekar krishnan from coimbatore and some of his other colleagues want to know how do you differentiate ibsc from patients with normal transit constipation uh, this is a confusion i think all of us get confused about it normal transit it means uh, this is no slow transit so slow transit so of all 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 the constipation three phase physiology normal transit slow transit and and pelvic dyspnea for pelvic floor dyspnea we know how to diagnose for slow floor transit no urge or low urge to pass stool and stool less frequent than usual normal transit means the person has a passive stool every day but they feel incomplete incomplete a part of perception and so there's no parameter by which we can diagnose normal transit so slow transit we have a parameter but there's a lot of gap between normal transit to slow transit and all our so this is a clinical so we can convert low normal transit to ibsc or functional constipation both are synonym for our purpose we call it either functional constipation if there is no pain functional constipation with pain is ibs then we have a slow transit constipation and pelvic floor as a separate entity and more importantly the question the, on uh, pelvic floor on uh, transit sorry yes sir sorry go go ahead. complete complete pelvic floor and pelvic floor and slow transit can can occur together so also transit may not be end stage like chronic intestinal sort of obstruction but they could be an early stage where the free patient don't feel to pass stool the stool is not coming less at the same time whatever stool comes they also have defect in in rectum uh, coordination therefore they have combination the combination we must remember that this could be a same patient can have both these together therefore we should choose therapy accordingly a question again on transit dr sunil wants to know what is the protocol for transit study do we use the one that is recommended in india has it been validated or do we still use the western one so i may not have the final word on this because uh, see the, the standard uh, is what is defined in the west and all most textbook will write that but at the same time the indians may have a faster transit on their data uh, both on hydrogen based test based data that indians have high transit and so therefore dr kudey ghosal only small subset of eight patients so he demonstrated that but this eight just eight to 12 patients so it is not big data so we cannot take this as final word but we should keep in mind that our patient may have a uh, may have a may be different but again a chilly protocol i'm not too sure about it the next issue is you it's all right to differentiate as normal transit slow transit but is does it actually make a difference 
in therapy are the response difference in these two groups that's a question from a couple of uh, people who have uh, tuned in absolutely absolutely that if we have a slow transit constipation we should prefer to use sympathetic mimetic drugs drug which can improve colonic motility like procolobride this could be drug i prefer to use i might you like to use bisacodil uh, at the cost of its side effect because bisacodil is a great drug but it leads to side effect in 40% patients or sodium picosulfate so sodium picosulfate bisacodil or procolobride if you are thinking slow transit constipation because the the mechanism is a colonic hypomotility or colonic inertia you need to use a drug which can improve colonic motility and therefore you use these drugs so in normal transit constipation you can use uh, any garden variety starting from fibers to 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 osmotic agents to uh, lubricants and you can use one or in combination and if the, if they fail go to second line drugs like uh, uh, like using procolobride sorry uh, the uh, uh, lubiprostone or even to uh, other drugs come uh, dr hardik from hyderabad and many other colleagues have asked what's the duration of treatment for procolobride i mean the studies have been done on a finite uh, duration but how long can you use it safely i think we we can use for longer only thing that we want to remember that this is the class of drug which uh, have shown earlier cardiac side effect with cisapride and uh, tigacerol uh, therefore the drug have been banned from uh, use clinical use therefore so once you remember that if you using a patient have a pre existing cardiac disease you should be more careful about these drugs but these drugs are study which are available for 6 months post marking surveys but people are using for even longer period of time if the drug works well or one can also do that uh, uh, switch on to therapy in between so you keep use a uh, procolobride for 6 months then switch on for some time for maybe 2 3 months then go back again kind of Uh, well dr uh, naresh i think we are now reaching close to 130 um, uh, i think there is a, there are over 230 questions and uh, probably we'll be here the rest of the evening if we try to answer uh, many more of those so i think it now is my pleasant duty to uh, thank uh, professor govind makaria for an, a superb exposition of the subject of chronic constipation an extremely common problem and with a lot of misperceptions and misconceptions uh, prevalent western indian uh, controversies around i think he's done a great job of simplifying them going systematically and uh, point wise and giving you a road map of how to approach uh, these patients so thank you very much uh, govind and uh, also i uh, thank you dr naresh uh, bhat uh, thank you very much for a lot of uh, thoughtful and thought provoking questions uh, putting them the ones that have come from our uh, viewers Well I think uh, this is the 12th um, uh, talk in this series of ISG master classes and uh, we are now shifting gear we are changing to a format in which we'll be having these master classes once a week so the next time we meet for this will be next sunday on the 31st of may again from 12 noon to 1 pm and uh, the topic for the discussion Uh, for the master class next time is uh, going to be functional dyspepsia which will be the um, presented by the speaker will be professor usha datta from uh, pgi chandigarh so we uh, look forward to meeting with uh, all of you once again uh, next sunday and uh, before we leave i think i would like to also thank our uh, technical team um dinesh and amol and ramesh have been doing a great job and yogita has been very competent in putting forward all these huge number of questions uh, that uh, 235 now that have come in from the viewers also i'd like to thank uh, san for their continued support to this effort for the master classes and with that i think uh, we can come to the end of the session thank you all for participating and making these master classes such a success thank you okay, okay bye bye Bye. Bye.